I want to speak on the cure for heart trouble. And there are thousands of people here tonight that have heart trouble, but you may not know it. I'm talking about spiritual heart trouble. And I want to take as our text the 22nd chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind. That's the first commandment. And love your neighbor as yourself. Who is your neighbor? Your neighbor is not only the person that lives next door, but it's the person that lives in your community, that lives in your city, that lives in this country, that lives in the world, because the whole world has become a neighborhood without being a brotherhood. Technology, like CNN, is carrying everything that is done in the world to the whole world, and we've become a neighborhood, and we're to love all those people that we see on the television that are suffering and dying for whatever cause they may represent. And he said, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. I want to talk tonight on the cure for heart trouble. Do you love Christ with all your mind? all your soul, all your strength, and all your heart? If you don't, you may miss the kingdom of heaven. You see, your heart is the center of your life. When you lose heart, everything else in life collapses. When Jesus began his earthly ministry, he announced that he'd come to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted. Now we've just heard these gifts given to these organizations that are helping people that have broken hearts or they're homeless or they're suffering. How many people live out in the suburbs that have big fine and beautiful homes but their hearts are broken? Perhaps their children have rebelled or perhaps they're on the verge of a divorce and their hearts are breaking. Jesus Christ came to heal the brokenhearted. The heart is talking, talked about throughout the scriptures. It's considered far more than a bodily organ that a surgeon can operate on. It's the seat of the emotion. And on Valentine's Day, it's a day for sweet hearts. And it has as its symbol a heart. We salute the flag and we put our heart, our hand on our hearts. When we become frightened or excited, we put our hands over our hearts. It's the center of our being, the center of our emotions and our feelings. But the Bible also teaches that the heart is the seat of decisive action. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. He said it in his heart. There is no God. In Proverbs 4.23 it says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. The very issues of your life come from your heart. Dostoyevsky said a century ago, God and the devil are fighting, and the battlefield is the heart of man. And your heart tonight is a battlefield and the devil and God are fighting for control of your heart. Who are you giving in to? Who are you surrendering to? The devil or to Christ? That's the decision you have to make tonight. Believe it or not, you're going to leave here making a decision. The heart is the seat of belief as well as the base of doubt. Christ said, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts and murders and adulteries, and fornications, and thefts, and false witnesses, and blasphemies. All these things Jesus said come from the heart. You see, the heart is the center, is the seat of life. The Bible says your heart shall live forever in Psalm 22:26. Your body is going to die, 
but your soul, your spirit, that part of you that can be summed up with the word heart is going to live forever. And the heart is considered the symbol of the entire person. The heart has come to stand for the center of the moral, spiritual, and intellectual life of a person. It is the seat of a person's conscience and life. The question I want to ask tonight is this, is your heart right? Is your heart right with God? I don't ask about your outward life. I'm not asking about your intellectual life or your financial status or your social status. I'm asking a burning question. Is your heart right toward God? The Bible teaches that our hearts are sinful. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperate to wicked who can know it. It seems that evil is getting worse. It seems that the devil is on a rampage throughout the world. And that rampage captures you. You may not realize it, but little by little and little by little your heart is hardened toward the things of God. In Mark 7, Jesus says, from within, out of the heart of men, out of the heart, perceive evil thoughts. Do you have evil thoughts? And adulterers and fornications? It's not just the act. It's the thought, it's the lust. Murder? Have you ever hated anybody, been jealous of someone? Then you're guilty. Thefts, cheating in school, covetousness. You want what the other one has. You want things better in life than you're able to provide. And so you covet what the other man has. Deceit. How many of us deceive our children, our wives, our husbands, our parents, our neighbors, our friends? And evil eye and blasphemy and pride and foolishness, all of these things, he said, come out of the heart. The same sun which melts the snow hardens the brick. Jesus Christ knocks at your heart's door and you can soften your heart to him and receive him or you can harden your heart and reject him. You have that ability. Are you softening your heart toward him? Are you hardening your heart? How many times have you dedicated your life to Christ? How many times have you promised? But you continue really deeply to harden your heart. I heard about a little girl and the mother and they were peeling potatoes and came to one with a dry rod and the little girl said, Mother, that potato's not a Christian. It has a bad heart. What is God's attitude towards your heart? He knows the heart. We heard on network television a few days ago that there's a new computer which is having fed into it 2,000 pieces of information on each of the five billion people who currently inhabit the earth. It won't be long till they'll know everything about you. Man will know. What do you think about God? He knows everything you've done and said and thought since the day you were born. And he knows you're going to have to face the judgment. And you may stand at the judgment and say, but Lord, I don't remember that. I wasn't guilty of that. God says, Turn on the amplification. Turn on the screen. And you'll say, I forgot that. But it's there. What is God's attitude towards your heart? He knows the heart. He knows everything about you. In Psalm 44 it says, Shall not God search this out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. The things you're sweeping under the rug. He knows. 
I remember when I was pastor of a church near Chicago and I would go call on the parishioners. And sometimes I would look, I could see through the window and I could see the woman running here and there, grabbing everything, see them sweeping things under the rug, getting ready for the preacher. They didn't know I was coming. Getting rid of the things they thought I might be disturbed about. What about God? He sees it all the time. He knows the heart. He knows everything about you. The scripture says, I search the heart. God's searching your heart right now. Shall not God search this out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. He knows all your secrets. You can't hide anything from him. It's like the tapes that were made that we heard about at Watergate and places like that. The tapes were there. And God has a tape machine running. He has a television machine running of your heart, the inside of you, what's really there. And you don't really know Christ. You claim you do, but really deep inside, you're not sure. God says, I search the heart. Shall not God search this out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. He weighs and tries. And he balances you with the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount and the great law that we read and the life of Christ. Many think they can hide. I remember the story of down in the South some years ago. There were some boys and their father said that he was going to town and he'd be back in a couple hours and they knew that there were some watermelons in the watermelon patch that were ripe. So they went and he had told them not to disturb those watermelons. He was saving them. They knocked on the watermelon and found two or three of them that were ripe. They looked all around and they plucked the watermelons and took them out into the woods and broke them open and ate them and it tasted good because I was one of the boys. <laughs> My, it tasted good out there. Then we didn't know what to do. We dug a hole and we buried the rind and the seed. And one day my father was driving some cows up from the pasture and he saw an interesting sight. He saw little watermelon sprouts coming up all around. <laughs> we couldn't hide our sin. And you can't hide from God. But the blood of Christ, which was shed for you, can cover your sins and justify. You see, the word justification means just as if you'd never sinned. Think of it. You can be placed before God tonight as though you'd never committed one sin. That's the glory of the cross. That's the power of the blood of Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. And when God cleanses your sin by the blood, it's cleansed forever and buried in the depths of the sea. And God cannot even remember them anymore. The heart of Christ bled on that cross. And it's only through the cleansing of that blood that we can be forgiven of our sin. The blood of Jesus Christ is for all. There's plenty of room at the foot of the cross for everybody. Of all ethnic groups, all races, all people in every conceivable social and financial standing, there's room for you. Whosoever will may come. And then God prepares your heart by the Holy Spirit. You can't come to Christ just any one time you want to. You come when the Holy Spirit draws you and convicts you. 
whose heart the Lord openeth in Acts 16, 14. God has to open your heart and he's opening your heart tonight through this message and through this service. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit and he's doing that here tonight by the hundreds of people are being convicted of their need of Christ. And then what does God do? God gives you a new heart. God says an old heart will not do. God doesn't patch you up. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of the flesh. Christ said, except a man be born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. God comes into your heart. He gives you a new heart. How do you receive it? First, you must repent of your sin. You can't repent by yourself. Repentance means that you say, Lord, I've sinned. I'm sorry for my sin. And I'm willing to turn from my sin if you'll help me. I can't do it alone. You have to help me, Lord. And he'll help you. And then by faith you receive Christ into your heart. 